Hi, and welcome to this episode of I've Got This Kid. I'm your host, Sharina Williams, licensed speech and language pathologist, homeschooling mom of two, wife of one, here to share everything speech, language, play, development, homeschooling, and all of that other stuff that falls in between. World changers, this is our final episode for the month of November. Are you crying on the inside? I am, a little bit on the outside, only, mainly on the inside though, you know, eh. I feel bittersweet when I have like a lapse in episodes. It's like, yeah, I like Thanksgiving and I like the break. But at the same time, I'd love to be with you guys. But I also want you guys to enjoy your family and reflect on all those things that you're grateful for. I know I'm grateful for my family. I'm grateful for you guys. I'm grateful for this space. And I'm just, I'm grateful. I got a big old grateful heart right now. So we are continuing with, can't we all just get along? Mm. The last two episodes, we talked about sibling jealousy, and then we talked about sibling exclusion. And today we're going to switch gears a little bit. It's still going to be about conflict, but it's really going to be about the collaboration team. And so the title of this one is my collaborative team won't collaborate. Ooh, stinkies. We're going to get them all the way together today. And so we're going to deal with that kind of conflict. And here is our question. Dear Sharina, my sugar is 32 months old. He receives speech and language therapy and early intervention services. My team does not get along. They give conflicting strategies and goals and refuse to cooperate with each other. It's to the point that I don't know what should be applied at home. I do nothing because I'm tired and I let them work with my son during therapy time. I heard your show and I know I should be doing something, but... What do I do when the people who are supposed to guide me won't get on the same page? Ew and yikes, world changer. That stinks. And thank you for sending in your question. We're going to get this situation all the way together today because this stuff gets my blood boiling. Not only have I been in this position, but I cannot, I cannot stand when team members don't get along to the point of where it starts to become a hindrance to the family. We're adults and we can figure this out and I want them to get this 100% together. Now, I will say this, it's extremely rare that everyone is 100% right or 100% wrong. And I say rare because sometimes it does happen. And if I were in your shoes, here's what I would do. And this is what I have done in the past. One, do your homework. Observe which methods from each therapist are most effective. And what I mean by that is, what is your sugar responding to the most? What method of intervention is he responding to the most? Is he responding to both during that time? Or is he responding during that time, but there's no change at home? If you notice that the method that, you know, is the most effective by the therapist is carrying over in the home. That's the one that you probably want to gravitate towards, possibly, because that depends on what they're doing then. Is this something that works when you try it? Because that's most important. Like it could work for the therapist. And I heard you say like you kind of taken a hands off approach because you're like, I don't know what to do because they keep telling me all this stuff and it's eh, right. But have you actually tried some of the stuff that they're doing? Did they actually teach you how to do the stuff that they're doing? Because if it's something that works when you try it and it's something that works when they try it, that's a win-win. But if it's something that when you try it, it's like operation fail and they didn't necessarily teach you, then we need to put some tools in place to make sure that you're being taught how to do this stuff. And and if it's a yes, then again, that's the route that you want to go. And there might be pros on both sides. Like there may be a play strategy that the early interventionist introduces that your sugar loves. And then for the language side, there may be something that they're doing with the language that works fabulously. And in some cases, it may be the other way around to where maybe the early interventionist was like, hey, I'm going to do some simple signs. And the speech therapist was like, I'm going to work on language and pecs. And you find that little sugar is doing great with sign language and terrible with pecs. So guess what you want to go with sign language because that's the method that works best, right? And so again, like I said at the beginning, nobody's 100% right and nobody's 100% wrong or it's extremely rare that somebody's 100% right and 100% wrong. So that would lead me to the next thing. I would call a meeting. I would express my thoughts and my feelings with the therapist, both therapists, not just one 
and not just the other. Because then that takes away their desire to bash each other when the other one is not present because you're not about to get yourself involved in that either. That's foolishness. That don't have nothing to do with you. Their personal feelings about each other. What does have to do with you is what they're doing for you and your sugar and your family. And so during that time, I would come with my notes, emphasize the things that you like and the things you do not like. Emphasize the areas that you want to see changed. Emphasize that you're a team and that team needs to be on the same page for the good of the sugar and for the good of you. Because remember, you are the number one advocate and that's why you do your homework first before calling that meeting. So you can be like, hey, this is what's going on. And then in that meeting, I would ask each therapist, why are you doing what you're doing? People take for granted the question why. We ask every other question except for the why. Why is so important? Because it tells everyone the reason that something is occurring. For example, why do we use this goal? Why do we do this? Why do we do that? What's the outcome that we're looking for? Why do we think that this is effective over another goal? Why do we think that this modality is the best versus the others? And I brought this up a little bit earlier as an example. One of the most conflicting goals that I would experience is PECS, and that's picture exchange system versus verbal language during the birth to three population. And the reason that I would experience so much conflict with that is because other collaborative professionals would gravitate towards PECS, not realizing that most families use the book, don't use the book, don't, it just don't work. And they're still usually trying to go for verbal language. And so I think that it's important that we're able to explain the why And that also comes with understanding like sugar's brain and anatomy and understanding how they learn and what's best for them. And also understanding like what kind of learner that sugar is and what can the parent realistically do. And so as a clinician, you want to make sure that your team is adapting what they're doing to you. And so that's why we ask about why are you doing this goal and what makes this goal effective for us? It can't be because, well, this is what I did with every other family. Well, that's good for every other family, but that's not something that I want for my family. And I wanna make sure that what we're doing makes sense to us because when you leave, I have to do this stuff. And so a lot of times this conversation gets left off the table that, hey, we as the clinicians are not here to get our needs met, we're here to meet other people's needs. And so we have to make sure that by meeting those needs, you are being heard, but you have to do your part and ask the heavy questions. And that leads me to question four. Ask each therapist what? What is the long-term benefit of this goal? Long-term benefits in the now are two different things. You know, the last thing asking the why, I asked, why do we think this goal is effective? But we want to know what too. We want to know what is the long-term implications of doing this goal this way? What is this going to build on? How is this going to build to them getting to where they need to go? Is this a goal that they learned? Or again, is this tailored to your specific family needs? Because lots of children are delayed talkers, but how we get them to speak, that can change from sugar to sugar. And so sometimes you have to have, as a clinician, you have to have a lot of tools in your box in order to make sure that it's meeting the needs of the family. And World Changer, this is where a little bit of research comes in on your part to find out what are the best methods to work with my sugar and what have I personally practiced? And this is where I get on you about doing nothing because there's something that we can always be working on. It doesn't matter what it is. Like there's something that can always be worked on. And I understand the frustration because it's super frustrating when your team is not on the same page. And so we really wanna make sure that we're doing everything that we can to do what we can to get our sugar to where we need them to go. Because chances are, if you're doing nothing with them and you're with them most of the time, then that's reinforcing the stuff that we need to be undone. And that leads to another level of frustration and it leads to another level of risk, especially if you see sugar performing in therapy and not performing with you. 
because that means that they have the skill to do it and the capability to do the stuff that they're doing in therapy, but it's not getting set in stone and they're only doing it in this setting and it's not being generalized across different areas. And we want to avoid that like the plague because whatever they're doing with you, chances are that's what they're going to do, you know, in the real world when you're not around. And so that's where the what comes in. Like we really want to make sure what's the long-term benefit What can I do to support and what are they doing, the therapist, to show you how to carry out this goal? And I would be asking those questions like, what are you doing to show me how to carry this out? What are you doing to show me how to make sure that I'm empowered and I feel good about what's going on? Or I can say that I don't even like this goal. I don't even think it makes sense. I I don't agree with either of you guys, but to me, this doesn't make sense. And I'm not trying to take sides, but this is what I think. Number five, polite firmness. Somehow, some way, we are in a society to where we don't want to offend people anymore. And it's got us almost walking on eggshells. If you say something that somebody doesn't like, then it becomes an offensive thing and we become a hater or a basher of a person because we don't agree. Like we have totally confused as a society the difference between disagreeing and dislike. I can disagree with you and still like you, right? I could disagree with something that you do and dislike you, but we've gotten so shallow and so vain to where it's become, you get canceled if you disagree with me, or if you don't like something I do, I'm going to cancel you. And it's childish. <laughs> I, 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 I have to say that it's childish. And this is my soup talk and these are my personal feelings, but I say polite firmness and I give that soup talk because... Sometimes we're so scared now to say that, hey, I don't like the way that this is going. It has nothing to do with my feelings towards you. It has nothing to do with me liking you. I just don't like how this is being carried out. And people will take that and run with it and turn it into something that it's completely not. It's just like if your child accidentally threw a ball and popped you upside the head and you say, hey, I don't like that. Well, cancel culture says nowadays that, well, if you didn't like that, then I'm hashtag not dealing with you and all this other stuff and just takes it to like this extra extreme. It doesn't have to be all that. We get along by being able to be honest. And soon as we take away that ability to be politely honest and politely firm, then we put at risk the way that we engage and interact with each other. And it's gonna be a nasty, nasty repercussion down the line from us going this route. So so I challenge you world changers, to be careful with that as it pertains to this. Remember, polite firmness. Most therapists are nice people. Most therapists are really nice people. Like I'm yet to find the speech therapist that is not the nicest person in the world. Same with early interventionists. Like they are usually really nice people. People in helping fields for the most part, I mean, we get stressed out, we're human and we get burnt out, we're human. But as far as like the heart of like what we do, like we do this because we love to do this because there's no dollar amount in the world that would make a therapist do their job unless they love doing their job because of the demand that comes with it. But we love it because we love helping and we love seeing people thrive or we've had an experience. But at the end of the day, it really does come down to, I want to make a difference. I want to see a difference. I want to see something. And it doesn't matter what population. But our niceness, <laughs> as nice as we are, <laughs> that's not that's not the goal. Like us being nice, it's great that we are nice, but our goal is really to be knowledgeable and helpful for you. That's the goal. We are nice and, and probably charming and a lot of other things, but our goal is to help. And if we're not helpful, we're not doing our job. And if we're not tooling you up, then we're really not doing our job. And so I don't want you to confuse a smile and a nice person with a need. You have a need in most cases. If you have a speech therapist or early early interventionist, then there is a need there. And so them being nice and coming into your home or meeting you virtually or however they're meeting you is not, and being nice and working with your child is not enough. And so I need you to be politely firm and say what your need is and express that need and describe that need. And why you have that need. 
Because at the end of the day, remember, you have to live with sugar and you have to be their biggest advocate. And if your needs are not being met and your family's needs are not being met and they're teaching your sugar two different things and sugar isn't using any of that stuff, then it's time to say, hey, both of you guys are doing a great job individually, but as far as when it's time for sugar to apply this stuff and me to apply this stuff, it's not working, which means this is not working. So I need us to do something different to where we're all on the same page. That's polite. That's firm. It has nothing to do with like or dislike. You could love that person, but you cannot like some of the stuff that they're doing. And you can say that for change. And that's okay. That is okay. I wish more people would say it. I would also tell them that their conflict, it's not going to work that they need to get on the same page to teach strategies that will work for your sugar. And I've said this throughout the episode time and time again, at the end of the day, it's about your sugar and your sugar's needs. But we need them to stop the conflict because that's an unnecessary stressor on you, especially when it's like meeting time and going over goals and the goals are conflicting. And I did this because I thought that this was best. Well, that is good and, and jolly and I'm happy for that. But I want you guys to be on the same page. And I want you guys to make sure that these strategies are a go for everybody and that everybody's happy. And that means compromise. Everybody has to compromise. Remember, the therapist is here not for you to serve them, but for them to serve you. And so if they just can't get it together, if they really can't get it together, then you might have to figure out as a team, especially if there's no other options around, what other areas of development that EI can just specifically work on and what areas of development the SLP can work on. And EI is early intervention is and SLP is speech language pathologist. It might just be that divided to where you work on this lane and you stay in your lane and I work on this lane and I stay in my lane and the two shall never meet because you know what? We know enough to know that we're just not going to agree, but we can agree that we want what's best for this little sugar. And that means that we need to do our best in the areas that we shine or that works best for this family or what they think works best for them. And it might be that case. It genuinely might be that way. And then the EI and the SLP have to get on the same page to do what they need to do to make sure that little sugar is getting what they need. Because again, it's not about us. It's about you. And number six. In the worst case, worst case scenario, it's gotten completely out of hand and they just cannot get it together. If one refuses to cooperate, I am from the school of it's okay to say goodbye, it's okay to throw in the towel, it's okay to say as much as I like you, this just ain't gonna work. It's okay. It is okay to say, I'm going to have to seek other support who's going to be more willing to be cooperative and collaborative and work for and with me and my family. It's okay to say that just because somebody has a title behind their name and a degree does not mean that they're a great fit for you. Be honest with yourself. Be honest for your sugar. If not for you, for your sugar, you're fighting for your sugar. So make sure that you're having that serious, honest conversation. You really want your team to be collaborative. You want them working together. They don't have to go skipping and, and, you know, hand in hand singing kumbaya, but you want them to like work together enough to be able to agree on what works and what, and disagree on what doesn't work. So just keep that in mind because most important, we don't want to miss out on that valuable time. And 32 months is valuable time. We don't want to miss out on that because the adults simply don't want to play nice and their egos are in the room and pride is in the room and all these other things that don't have anything to do with you and your sugar. And so we want to make sure that the decision that's being made works best for you and your sugar. At the end of the day, world changer, you have to do what's best for you guys. You have to advocate for yourself. You have to advocate for your sugar. That doesn't mean go pulling, you know, like bulldozing through therapists because you're like, I don't agree with them and I don't agree with this and I don't agree with that. Like, that's not it either. What I'm saying is that in this case, it seems there's some genuine conflict that's causing a world changer to do nothing to generalize goals. And in this case, if your team simply isn't getting along, it's time to put something into action to make some changes as to how this thing is being carried out. Remember, we are here to serve you. It's not the other way around. You're not here to serve us. You're not here to be our best friend. If a friendship does come out of it, that's a beautiful thing. But at the end of the day, we're here to help and we're here to be a part of the family and we're here to be a part of the team. And that means in order to be part of the family and part of the team that we're doing 
what it takes to help the family and help the team and even challenge systems in place that are going on in the family and in the routine to get sugar to where they need to go. So please don't allow yourself to miss out on that valuable time. And it really, again, is no hard feelings. It's really pushing the purpose. So pray, world changer, use wisdom and go from there. Everything will work out. Speaking of working out, did you work out your finger last week? Or are you going to work out your finger this week? (laughs) And pre-order your copy of Watch Me Connecting to Your Child Through Play. There are so many tips and tools in there that will help you maximize language growth through play as well as interaction and attention and reading and problem solving. And it's fun because I'm fun. So I'm not going to write boring. So it's fun. It's a fun read. It's a quick read. It's an on the go read. It's a for you read world changer. It's for your friend world changer. It's a stocking stuffer world changer. It is all of that and a bag of chips world changer. Make sure that you get your copy. Also, if you haven't done so already, become my social media friend. Follow the links below. Click on it. Share the book on your page. Share podcast episodes on your page. If there was a podcast episode that stuck out to you and you're like, hey, you know what? This one was fire. It helped me. Or this one, can you just add a little bit more information? Go to my social media page and I'll give you a little bit more. That's what I'm here to do. Check out my updated website at I've got this kid.com. My team and I have been working hard to make sure that we're connecting with you. You'll find signups for all kinds of classes, events, and webinars because world changers, I have to make sure we're tooling each other up, that I'm getting you guys where you need to go. And so what's going to start coming in the month of January is webinars and other things like that. So I am excited. I'm really, really excited to be able to host this stuff and be a part of that and be a part of your world. So go check those out and see which one fits for you and, and speaks to you next week. We will be off for the holiday. Now, you can do one of two things. You can take the day off and say, all right, Sharina, none of you today. Or you can tune into past episodes and be like, Sharina, I totally need to hear your quirky, fun voice. And you make me laugh. And sometimes you make me sad. And I have all kinds of feelings because you challenge some things that I necessarily didn't want to talk about. But no, I need to bring up every time. And that's that's what it is. I just I just can't get enough of you. So you can definitely tune in to past episodes Or you can send in questions for the month of December at questions that I've got this kid.com. I would love for you to post on my page things that you're grateful for or past episodes again that you're most grateful for because I am always grateful to come here and share my knowledge and experience with y'all weekly. And I'm grateful that y'all continue to tune in so we can find ways to push to purpose. World changers, happy Thanksgiving. Have a great time. Eat lots of food. Cook lots of food. Go hug somebody. Put a smile on your face. Have fun, world changers. Take that spa day. Do something for you during this time. And until the next time, I'll see you in December. Take care.